public as we speak. Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is October 24th, if I, is that right? Yes, I think it's right. Um, 2012. And tonight we're going to remix Karen. Um, anyway. <laughs> Karen Fastenpower has uh, uh, her, uh, oh, it's about a 14-minute, uh, with credit, 17 minutes, <laughs> uh, video that she put together um, for the K-12 online conference, which we hope to uh, speak um, about in general. If you, There are quite a few really interesting things going up. But we picked this one um, for tonight uh, because... Uh, some of us are in it, and we, uh, you know, we like when you talk about us. <laughs> Sorry, that's not really. Fair. But um, anyway. so uh, it's really nice to the the kind of partnership that uh, we've had um, over the past few months, and um, as so we're gonna kind of look at your. Um, it was visioning new curriculum. Um, and uh, together, so we thought we'd look at it together and talk about it, and we've invited a few other people to come as well, but um, let's get, let's start here. Sue King, could you introduce yourself, and uh, and then we'll just come across that way with brief introductions. Welcome. Hi, I'm Sue King. I am a Director of Teaching and Learning for the Upper Perkiomen School District um, in Pennsburg, Pennsylvania outside of Philadelphia. Cool. And um, how did you come to this tonight? And what are your, what's your interest kind of in visioning new curriculum? <laughs> well, in, um, I actually crossed, crossed paths with Karen a number of years ago when I was working as a middle school principal in Hershey and um, have always, uh, we, we've maintained contact since then, have a great interest in uh, curriculum and really in revisioning um, curriculum as it's uh, kind of been in uh, place in K-12 schools. Great. Thank you for joining us. Paul, oh, you could do next introduction here. Hi, Paul. Hi, everyone. This is Paul O. Oh. I'm with the National Writing Project. I'm actually in my home right now in Oakland, California, still unpacking boxes. But uh, typically, I work out of an office in Berkeley, California. It's great to be here. And I have known Karen now for what seems like forever. And yet, I think it's really only a, a couple of years, maybe, maybe not even two years. And I feel like in that time, I've uh, ridden her coattails on many projects that have been incredible. It's been a fun ride. Very cool. And I'm Paul Allison with the uh, New York City Writing Project. And um, and Karen came up to our school last week, so it was really nice to have her visit us at uh, the Bronx Academy Senior High. And uh, she got to sit next to some of our students and get to know them. And um, anyway, so we'll talk more about that as we go. So very nice to have you all here tonight. Uh, Monica. Welcome. I'm Monica Hardy, and I'm in Loveland, Colorado, where we're experimenting with city or community as curriculum. Cool. Karen, brief introductions. We'll just go alphabetically here, in reverse, if you didn't notice here. <laughs> I'm Karen, and I just love everybody in this room. I'm so happy to be here with you all tonight. And uh, I work with schools on curriculum and technology integration. And I also um, do a lot with the PDPU School of Ed. And I think we will be talking about that a little bit as it relates to the K-12 online conference as well. Cool. Christina, welcome. Hi. Uh, we can hi. hear you. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I'm Christina Cantrell, and I work for the National Writing Project. And I guess really you guys inspired me to really um, pay attention to curriculum and what curriculum was and um, how to think about it and how to um, and what questions need to be asked. So I'm just excited to be here and think about it more with you all. And Chris Sloan, welcome. Hello. Uh, my name is Chris Sloan, and I live in Salt Lake City, Utah, and I teach high school at Judge Memorial. I teach English and media, 
And I'm interested because I, you know, I like a lot of Karen's work, but um, you know, I struggle with curriculum all the time. It seems like, you know, you'd think after a few years of teaching, you'd just have it down and it would just be a boilerplate or something. But uh, you know, I'm always struggling with uh, or working with um, curriculum. So. Cool. So, Karen, I think your your video actually starts your presentation begins with that kind of question: What is curriculum? Um, and I think I've marked it pretty carefully, and and I might be able to show it. Curriculum plays an important role in schools. It is the framework for what is learned when and in what sequence, based on our beliefs about what children need to become productive members of society. Curriculum is the roadmap for learning. Curriculum is an outline, and not necessarily all the details, of how these goals will be accomplished. It is not the textbook or the digital content, or how these instructional materials will be used by teachers and learners. However, this framework is filled in by classroom practice and instructional materials. And too often in the past, these materials have taken a one-size-fits-all, top-down approach. Karen, do you want to read that question there? And then let's see who wants to jump in and, and have some thoughts about There are sections that are longer than that, but this is just sort of setting up. You know, I'll read it. <laughs> what options for curriculum, classroom practice, and instructional materials can best prepare our students? What should curriculum be? I th so I think it's just about basic definitions here, is that right? Which I think are kind of important. But and also maybe, what does it mean to prepare our students? I know Sue and I and other people have had a lot of conversation about, you know, what is the purpose of school? And I think until you hone in on that, it, it's hard to talk about curriculum. So, who wants to say something? <laughs> I, I will. I, I love, I'll chime in. Um, I think it's... Um, one of the aspects of even answering the question is that the answer is very situational. Um, and by that I mean depending on the system in which you work, the school district, you have to think about the people who are responsible for delivering the curriculum and oftentimes their comfort level with what curriculum needs to be really impacts what curriculum ends up having to be. I'm not sure if that makes a lot of sense, but I, mean, I think I have this ideal vision of what curriculum and classroom practice should be based on what students truly need to learn. But then you have the people who work within the system who need something a bit more concrete and focused sometimes. Go ahead. Any three responses to that? So what is curriculum? What are we talking about here? Yeah, I guess that's what I was um, starting to wonder, Paul, too. Um, just thinking about curriculum, you know, you can think about curriculum as a set of um, uh, outcomes or objectives, right? But then you can also think of curriculum as an educative experience. Like, how do you organize an educational experience? So I guess... Um, I'm sort of wondering sort of how we're thinking about that. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the things that in, in brainstorming some things earlier with Karen, um, having student work as the focus of, of the curriculum seemed like an important idea. Like so, so defining, defining curriculum by what students actually make mm -hmm. um, might be one of the things. Right. To do. But Monica, do you want to throw in your notion of curriculum at this point? Yeah, I have to say that um, the first time that my soul really felt well about the word curriculum was when I heard Seymour Papert in a video talking about um, finding the curriculum inside each child. And so... Um, I, I think a lot of the work that we've done, people say um, the reason it's not for everyone is because there's no structure and some people don't like no structure. 
when in fact there's structure and everything. And so um, I guess in my mind I think of curriculum as that structure, but at its optimum I think it, you know, the ability to fill us facilitate curiosity from within and let it be driven, you know, from the kid it is where it sets well with me. And I, I would I would add, um, this is Paul, not necessarily a definition of what curriculum is, but but following up a little bit on what Monica was saying, I think what, in my view, what should be driving curriculum Two are the the educators who are are really conceiving of it, um, so involving teachers in that process and in, uh, in trying to design curriculum. And uh, I, I would also add that I think Karen's question is a really great one as a starting point in terms of what is the purpose of education, because I, I think that then really does define uh, or help us define then what we think of when we think of curriculum, uh, what we think of you know, when we think of this educa educative experience, as Christina mentioned. And I would just say that in, uh, in some conversations with, with people who, um, you know, are, are throwing around terms like um, college ready and work ready, um, as though that's the purpose of school. Um, I was talking to a, uh, someone who I work with in the Oakland Public Schools here who was saying that you know, he believes the purpose of school is to help um, our youth become community ready. And, uh, and I think that's a really interesting term. What does it mean to be ready to, you know, to be an adult in the community in which um, our youth live? Yeah, I was going to say something along those lines with, um, I think, you know, for me, I have a narrow focus, I guess, but, uh, you know, it's about um, two big things is literacy slash communication and citizenship would be like, two things I think we do a lot of in my situation and that seems pretty worthwhile to me. Do you want to say more how you, how you do that? Uh, well, you know, how do we communicate best in whatever medium we're working in is something that takes up a lot of my time and my teaching and my students work. Uh, so, you know, if I'm communicating on paper with someone with pen, um, there are different kinds of things that are taking place than if I am presenting that same idea or similar idea via, let's say, a YouTube. Um, and all those things are really important for people to do. Um, and so how do I communicate, to go back to Paul's idea, you know, how do I communicate well in my communities is really, you know, it sums up a lot of what I do. And academic communities are communities too, right? I mean, oh yeah, so, yeah. So that's, so yeah. I you know can I? Okay. One of the one of the thoughts I always have um, is that whatever I call curriculum is what I think I'm doing to interrupt the curriculum that they're bringing with them. So I don't, I think it's, and by that I mean the curriculum of TV, the curriculum of Xbox, the curriculum of, you know, the, 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 the standard culture. So I don't, think, I don't think any of our students are these, you know, wonderful natural beings. So, I mean, and I'll be very specific. So, so that one of, the, one of the places of curriculum is, is, you know, learning how to be thoughtful in responding to each other on a social network, right? Seems seems very simple, but what they bring with them isn't necessarily, um, you know, natural at all. It's it's what it's a learn it's learned in their culture, and um, and and I I I kind of think that what I think of the curriculum is is where I can interrupt some of that learning from our culture that I think isn't so positive. <laughs> And I, I have to ask how much of that culture is created because of the curriculum that we've prescribed when no one's asking for it. Well, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> I am curious, Karen. You're the one that has, you know, you learn so much when you put things like this together. And I'm just very curious what you've gleaned, you know, from this. So I'd love to hear that. Well, I really like your point that, you know, curriculum can be an individual thing and I think you know it's different for different students in different situations and I think that's really important I think one of the 
like I definitely in talking to a lot of people about this video got some some pretty um, strong backlash on the whole idea of curriculum. I wish Terry Elliott was here because he's like curriculum is horrible and just kind of all this and I'm like it doesn't have to be horrible but it doesn't have to be like a one-size-fits-all thing and a lot of a lot of people sort of that was their first we talked about what should curriculum be what should it not be I mean it shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all like and that's I think that's our our school environments now are so entrenched in that that I think the word curriculum now to people means something so specific and so like standard not not just standard standards based but an actual standardized approach where everybody's on the same page at the same time and I think that's just a tragedy because I think Paul's right there's curriculum is what's going on all the time and it's not it's it's not necessarily um, like a good or bad thing but I mean you kinda have to think about it in a in a bigger sense maybe it makes me think how um you know, if we think about it in a sort of, uh, this is sort of on the bad side, so I don't mean it as just a bad example, but, you know, if we think about the commercial commercial interests and how marketing is, is developed and then how, you know, the marketers are often creating educational experiences for whoever their target, target audience is, right? And so that itself is a curriculum, too, in a way. You know, it's like a very intentional, <laughs> experiential thing that's being developed um, and it does feel like there's probably you know many ways to think about it and less intentional ways too but you know I do think that it's sort of all around us um, and I think that's an interesting way to think about it actually and your videos actually point to all these sort of different examples Karen so so we could go back to the video unless somebody wanted to jump in Shall we do that? I think that's a, a relatively good um, uh, transition to the next section here, um, which I'll play. This, this will go for about, um, about three minutes. Rigid pacing, superficial assessment, and curriculum decisions made on the basis of things other than student learning have become all too common. But standards don't have to lead to standardization. What if the same standards, the same curriculum goals, could be achieved like this? Or this. Or even this.
Let's say somebody's listening to this as a podcast. Let's start that way. Who wants to summarize what you just saw there? That'd be a good way to do it. What Cheese were those making. examples? Cheese making, yes. And by the way, we've been joined by um, Liz Grenshaw as well. Liz, welcome. And she's not talking yet, but we'll see if we get her eventually. Okay. She said hi in chat. Okay. Cool. Liz, can you say hello? Uh, no, yeah. Okay, let's keep going. So, somebody describe a lot of Maker Fair things. Karen, why don't you describe what, what's in the video there? And that's um, building and shooting off rockets, which was a part of a summer camp out here that I was a part of. Um, a bunch of Maker Fair stuff, including cheese making and Lego for little kids programming and older kids programming and supercomputer computational projects and um, writing, national writing project, youth voices, writing novels, students writing grants um, for community service projects, building a house, my personal favorite. Was that yours? That was actually me sitting on That's top of I that thought. beam. <laughs> And my nephew was in the second part. Um, definitely an educational experience for him in lots of ways. Um, and I don't know what else I left off, but lots of doing stuff and making stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to say, Paul, that it, a lot of those images reminded me of um, teaching, you know, young kids in a in an like sort of in a progressive elementary setting. And I don't mean that um, in a negative way. I mean that I, I think I've always felt like um, a lot could be learned from the kind of making that happens in you know progressive um, settings for younger kids with regard to you know experiential learning basically. So that would imply that that um, curriculum has to do with how we set up bells and schedules and organize kids in a building too. It's not, right? I mean, it's not just... Is that a question for me? You mean or anybody, yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah. Because, because part, of what, part, part of what makes it more difficult as we go up is these structures where kids move around, you know, in these classes and, and so forth. I think it's partly that and it's partly just mindset. And I think there's often an an idea, particularly as you move up the grades, that there's so much content you have to plow through that there's no time to do stuff like that. And I mean, partly what I want to show with this video, and I sort of did, if you saw on the side of the video, those are actual correlations to some of the Common Core standards. Mm -hmm. And part of my idea was you can cover the standards and do stuff like this. I um, The one thing I didn't mention was the the kids singing. They're um, 13, 15, and 17, and that was actually at a Maker Fair. And they were so articulate and, I mean, you could tell they just have organized all this. And I watched them and I thought, this is better, you know, they're doing this in front of a big crowd. This is better than any public speech class you could ever do in high school, you know. Um, I had something to say about the making stuff. A um, little anecdote first, like, uh, you know, as my kids were growing up, I always collected their good stuff at the end of every year. So, you know, like I have extensive files on my kids, like, you know, I'm equivalent to J. Edgar Hoover or something. <laughs> I've got like tons of information on them. But I noticed as their years went on, like, like the folders got tinier and tinier. And so by the time they entered junior high, there was like nothing. I would look through their stuff through the year, at the end of the year, and I'd think like, man, there's really nothing that I want to save anymore, which was really sad. And so as a teacher then, I always think, I want them to leave with stuff that they can, you know, like bring home and mom and dad will just cry over or, you know, laugh over or treasure, you know. And um, the other thing that it made me think of was Dewey. You know, Dewey stuff all started with this practical knowledge that was rooted in kind of situation. And, you know, the longer we go on in school, it seems like we're, we're big into abstracting things, you know, but we're not too big into doing things. And uh, that's what I noticed about that segment was just all the doing, all the good doing, I guess we should say. Because we do a lot, but it's not really stuff that we want to keep in, in the upper grades, especially. 
I, I think one of the, the challenges is as you move to the upper grades, there's this belief that there's a certain amount of content in every subject area that every child has to get. Um, but that kind of falls apart because usually when they leave high school or if, if they go on to college, they don't remember a lot of that content anyway. So the fact that we made them take algebra and geometry and chemistry, although it theoretically may seem like a good idea, it really doesn't pan out. So I guess I continue to struggle with what type of content knowledge do kids really need or is it more important that we just set them up for continued learning and to really figure out for themselves what they want to look like what they want and need to learn to be successful as they move forward you know I this is not as big an idea as you guys are having so far but one of the one of the things that I was reminded of recently when I started working with a young man who struggles as a reader even though he's uh, you know 20 years old and um, he has to pass a US history exam right um, before he can graduate from high school um, and so people have been working with him. He came to me. He said, "I have to do an outline of American history." I said, "What?" You know. <laughs> so the, the point is the 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 broadness of of that of of what he was expected to learn um, interfered with him learning to read better. Right. So, so we we messed around with a couple ideas. He he started being fascinated by Abraham Lincoln. And, and um, you know, so we read an article together around Abraham Lincoln, and he started an inquiry into Lincoln, right, which, you know, is a fascinating character. But he's not getting the broad content of that history curriculum that, you know, he's supposed to get for the test, but he's learning how to read. And so I just worry that in covering all that material, uh, we're – we're not helping kids to read better. So, so he's going from a simple article about Lincoln, and now he's going to a more complex article because he's learned, he's been introduced to some of the vocabulary already there, right? And so he can use that vocabulary in the more complex. So I, I just, sorry to go so long with that example, but it just seemed to me that, that we lose a lot of sort of um, skills the kids need, like reading and writing and, and being able to make things when we cover material. Okay. Liz, is that you? I, <laughs> we can I, almost I, I, do this. Go ahead, Paul. I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, I was just going to quickly say that I think what you're talking about, too, reminds me of conversations about um, disciplinary literacy. So what does it mean to... To, uh, to understand history in the way that historians understand it, you know. Um, I mean, it's not always possible, and I think I think there is this tension between, you know, wh what do you know, what should kids know, like um, because, and and I don't know, maybe maybe there's nothing that kids should know, but I think I would argue that there are some things that I think, you know, we can make visible to kids that they might not find on their own, but. I think as much as possible, the idea that um, what we're giving kids are the tools to understand the discipline in the way that you know someone who is um, you know is is a, an expert in that discipline would would uh, approach uh, you know the content is really what we want to do. Which sort of sounds like what Paul was describing a little bit, like a starting with an inquiry and following a path. Um, or it could be. And, and I, would, I would say that I think, you know, I've seen, um, like, for instance, with the example of history, um, I, I worked with a, a professor uh, at, in um, Amherst, uh, at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, who he, um, at the college level, had his students investigate, um, like, the trial of Lizzie Borden. <laughs> and the idea was that they had to determine, like, you know, their own verdict um, based on primary source materials that they uncovered from that time, um, you know, come up with this reasoned judgment of was she guilty or was she not. 
Um, but in doing so, you know, they had this opportunity to really investigate, like, well, wh what were the, you know, what was going on historically at that time, in that time period that led to, you know, um, these differences in, in wealth, you know, that was, that, that was a part of this story that, you know, sort of the untold part of this story. So just, just an, as an example, I think uh, it's possible to start with like small incidents in history, like you were describing with your student, but those small incidents, you know, reveal um, broader aspects of, you know, of the time period. Mm -hmm. And Monica, you, you've been a math teacher. How have you dealt with that question of, because that's a big issue in math, right? Um, how are you going to cover all the material in math? Well, I think I did it pretty well. I mean, you figure out ways to um, to micromanage it, and that was my addiction. Um, <laughs> so the last four years, I haven't, you know, I resigned from math for that very reason, because it was nobody was asking the questions. <laughs> I mean, they, you know, when when they get engaged and there's a, a small percentage of people that really geek out on school math. I think mathematical thinking is is addictive in a good way. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess the way I dealt with it finally is I resigned myself from deliberately teaching it. But are there moments in these four years when you do find yourself teaching mathematical thinking? Or kids oh, learning it day. somehow? Every so day what? mathematical thinking. We're talking an about exponentiation that, and fractals and um, every day. And that's, that's, I think, why it became so clear to me that the only problem seems to be the compulsion of a prescribed curriculum. Um, it's not that anything's good or bad. It's just that compulsory piece when, when a, a person's not ready or not asking to know about it, you know, that it's probably not going to stick. I'd been using... Um, the percentage of 75% because it came from kids um, said they either cheat or cram the night before a test because they're busy too, you know, and so they're trying to get as much in as possible. And Denise Pope was just on with Steve Hargaden and she was saying the updated percentage is, is above 90%. I mean, this is at the university level as well. What, so, explain that? What do you mean? The percent? There's that many people her her quote tonight was that it was above 90% of kids cheat. Oh. And it was more, you know, when they got into it, it's more a matter of survival than it is of that they think that they're ethically cheating, you know. They, they to the kids, most of them didn't feel that they were cheating. So um, I guess that kind of goes with what you were talking about, um, about are we missing things like mathematical thinking and the ability to read because we're so concerned about covering things that we're going to test on because that's the visible part. That's the, the more visible part, you know, and maybe the, the less invisible is what is, is going to make us better community members, you know, like Chris is talking about. Um. Mm -hmm. Karen, are we far from your video? <laughs> well, I'm thinking as we're talking about Common Core, which I know is another topic that sends many people sort of in, in a not happy place, <laughs> but I feel like, you know, part, part of this, a big part of this video for me was that I really think that Common Core is an opportunity to focus less on content and more on those skills. And I think, I mean, this is kind of the rest of the video, but I think that as teachers, we need to sort of seize control of the situation of curriculum and make it about what, what we think is right. Because I think every teacher will tell you right now that where, you know, where most curriculum, where curriculum is in most schools is not where they think it should be. And, and you know, I don't want to sound flip to say, you know, teachers just need to take control and do what they think is right. But, I mean, somebody needs to. And, and I feel like Common Core is an opportunity to do that. So... I know other people don't feel that way, but let's watch the next next part of the video, though, um, which will be about five minutes here. I believe that the shift to the Common Core standards presents a truly unique opportunity for curriculum. With this new framework, decisions about new curriculum are being made all over the country. 
Millions of dollars are being allocated and spent even as you watch this video. To be most successful with these new standards, we need to see them as a new starting point, not as something just to be layered on top of everything else we've already been doing. This is a time we should be thinking about personalization instead of one size fits all, integrated process and skills instead of isolated content, real world instead of irrelevance, and iteration and collaboration instead of top-down hierarchies. It is time for a new era in curriculum. Beyond the Common Core, there are several other critical developments that make this a unique time for curriculum. One is the advent of digital content. The State Ed Tech Directors Association recently issued a report called Out of Print, Reimagining the K-12 Textbook in a Digital Age, in which they called on policymakers to complete the shift to digital resources in five years. And the textbook, the book itself, was the best technology that we had at the time, 50 plus years ago. At a time where information was scarce, where it was difficult uh, to share it, um, and uh, being able to bind that all together in one book and provide that to every student and every teacher was the best tool that we had at the time. In 2012, it's hard to argue that that is the most efficient uh, method to provide access, particularly given the dramatic changes in student population, where uh, books are one-size-fits-all, our students are hardly, uh, never have been, and are increasingly even less so. With students already using technology outside of school to create their own compelling content, and with some of the research that we cite in the paper and other research that's out there that talks about how the use of this content can play an increased role in student engagement and student achievement, and with the flexibility that digital content provides for us, especially open educational resources, can we really afford to wait any longer? Open Educational Resources, or OER, are not only free and digital, but are also open licensed so that anyone can use, adapt, and redistribute them. This permits legal remixing and sharing and encourages deeper learning. If it's open education resources, you can make good content better for this student and that student and that student because you can change it each time to meet that student's needs. While reducing cost is often a motivation for using OER, this may not be the most significant benefit. The state of Utah has been a pioneer in using OER in K-12. And it really turned out that cost was not the major factor that drove the interests of the teachers in the districts that were interested in participating with us. They were actually more interested in working with electronic resources that would increase their access and ability to use multimedia and other electronic resources in a seamless way. They wanted to have input in the design of our books. The benefits of openness go far beyond instructional materials. Engaging in a collaborative, open process builds teacher professionalism and ultimately creates a richer learning environment. So Open Text gave us some different options. We know that teachers have always shared materials and they've always shared books. This really helps us formalize that sharing process. One of the things that we found is that as teachers came together to create textbooks and to really talk about their content, those became very empowering conversations for those teachers. And they began to engage with their own content and pacing and scope and sequence in a way that hadn't really been open to them before because it meant that was how the book was put together. And so their conversations about what was going to happen in their classroom opened up a lot of depth and complexity as they began to plan things. Beyond textbooks, open resources can include video, simulations, and interactivities. Open practices can lead to teachers and learners creating their own learning experiences and collaborating with others to address real-world problems. Okay, so what opportunities do digital tools and open resources and processes offer? How can we best take advantage of those? And what does it mean to remix, share, and learn? Karen, do you want to say a little more about what you were thinking with those questions? And then, go ahead. 
sure. I mean, I think I think it kind of feeds back into what we were talking about before that curriculum should be fluid, and we all, mostly students, should should be constructing the curriculum, and OER is just one way to do that easily because it's all about sharing and sort of making lots of pieces available for people to remix and do that. So your your point about the Common Core standards is that obvious to everybody here that that we can just use that to build our own personalized education? <laughs> I mean, I, it is to me, but I'm not sure it is to a lot of teachers coming on. You know? Well, Paul, I wonder if we should go on and show your part. I, I forget okay. if that's the next part, but that's what I would really like to talk about. How you sort of have done that because we that was such a that. huge inspiration to me. Of what this could look like. Sure, but, uh, and Bonita, do you want to introduce yourself, or can you? No. Okay. <laughs> we'll figure that out as we go. Okay, so we'll watch the next section and then keep talking as we go here. One example of digital and open content in action is the work of Paul Allison, a high school English teacher in New York City. Paul has worked with New York City Writing Project's Youth Voices Initiatives and Peer-to-Peer -Peer University to experiment with an innovative new curriculum based on Common Core standards. This curriculum includes a series of learning challenges for English language arts, history, social studies, arts and media, and science. These challenges incorporate competencies such as citing evidence in conversations, independent reading, text-dependent research, formulating arguments in areas of interest, and self-directed learning. Yeah, it's different because um, usually we would have like classrooms, but now we do all of our work on computers. So it's like we manage our own classes and our own time period. So it's kind of different now because everything is on the computer. So Paul set up a grid for us, if you can see it like this. And it has all the stuff that we need to do for each subject. And we just cross it out every time we complete one of the tasks. Okay. Yeah, it's a lot of work. I'm doing like uh, like two grids because I need two Englishes. So I did about like, I say like eight on both. Well, my, my economic paper is on um, which president um, has the best economic proposal. So that's what I'm working on in economics. So basically, um, I had to do research on Obama and Mitt Romney and see which economic proposal I like the best and which economic proposal is better for the economy. Like the way you research is like annotating and then after you annotate, you go into the dialectical notes and then you write your draft and, and the essay and just put it all together. Um, well, my, my topic is, um, is like, how does music affect mood? So I'm, like, looking up that stuff. But right now I'm actually working on a book because there's, like, independent reading. So I'm reading the book and, like, I have to do stuff on that. And I'd rather do that. But. Students can also earn badges for the work they complete. You have to, yeah, it's you basically have to just, it. like, after you finish the assignments or whatever on the PTP thing, you can just... They give you the badges like after you finish all four of the one set thing. So, yeah. Um, I like it because it shows us like what we earned. So, like so far, I have two, and I feel good about myself because I accomplished something. So, yeah, it, it makes me feel good. Like it shows me that I can do more. So, and it like it pushes me to earn more badges and stuff. So, yeah, I like it. I, I enjoy it because it's independent work and uh, I'm a very independent person so yeah. like I can accomplish something and just go on my own but sometimes like I would like I, I, when I'm stuck like I need a teacher's help and like I usually I do this when I'm home so I, it's just hard like I don't have a teacher there to tell me or help me so I just have to wait until the next day for me to see the teacher and that's it. I'm just Hon getting used to it. Honestly I feel like like the computer helps a lot because it's on the computer or whatever but even if the assignments weren't on the computer and it was just independent work it would still kind of be the same like thing. This curriculum is collaborative and open. In fact students can and have improved upon the challenges. 
and other teachers can clone any of these challenges and modify them to best meet the needs of their own students. This innovative experiment combines all the elements we've talked about common core alignment, digital content, openness, personalization, and relevance. We're back. I was so happy that I didn't have to appear in that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. But uh, so reactions, thoughts? For Karen, do you want to pick up? <laughs> well, I wanted to say some stuff that's going on in the chat with okay. Chad right now. Mm -hmm. um, and we are talking about sort of is Common Core necessary for this or does it just provide an opportunity? But he says um, he's interested in the teacher piece of this and how do we help folks adopt a do-it-yourself approach um, to curriculum and that's sort of the next that's sort of foreshadowing the next piece of this but I mean I don't know Paul if you want to talk about sort of what what gave what made you do this and and see this as an opportunity or if other people like how can we get more people to sort of get excited about doing things like this because hmm. I think the stuff in your I, classroom is so exciting I, uh, that's, I didn't know you were going to ask that. I, what can I say? Did, you know, I, I, um, cause the common core standards and the, and badges too, I think all of that stuff could be used in a very different way than, than we mess with it. Right. So, so I wonder, I wonder what it is that, I look at it and I say, "Oh, we can use that because there's a core that that, that I want to get that I want to get to, right? It's the, it's the, it's it's the it's the inquiry. It's so so if you give me a Common Core standard that that will help me push kids toward their own individual inquiry, I can I can mess with that, but, you know? <laughs> right. So, well, and it's yeah. like the textbook publishers. I mean, they're very loose with correlating to standards and they sort of take their stuff and they do a correlation so why don't we do that as teachers I mean that idea of taking maker stuff or taking whatever you think is cool and do a correlation I mean the standards are not so restrictive that you can't do that but how do we get people to ha to feel like they have permission or you know are pushed to do that when I when I look at how standards are used Karen it's like um, in, at least at the elementary level, I have to say that standards are used to to uh, align to a, an assessment, and so teachers mm -hmm. are going to teach towards that. And so, um, so it's not quite as open. I mean, yes, when you read Common Core, you can see how you could design a very open-ended curriculum. But if if people proceed with the way we've been doing standards. Um, I think it's less likely just because people are going to be waiting for those assessments and aligning their curriculum that way. I totally agree. And I think that whether the new assessments live up to their promise or not is is going to have a lot to do with whether Common yes. Core turns out to be good. And I mean, I've heard descriptions of these new assessments that could be awesome and wonderful, or they could be the same old thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I just I, I just want to jump in and say. Um, Having known Paul Allison for many years, I think one of the things that to me is uh, is emblematic in in this work that we were looking at is the fact that I think Paul is a tinkerer uh, and and mm -hmm. has been for a long time. You know, so he uh, I think has taken uh, intellectual frameworks and pedagogical frameworks and has really tinkered with you know those um, in relation to like the work he's doing with students and so. I guess I wonder about that idea of, of tinkering and how we can encourage teachers to themselves be tinkerers and and then to coalesce around you know the ideas um, that they tinker with so that you know, they have a, a voice not just individually but collectively. Mm -hmm. and Paul, I, I'd like to build on that idea, Paul, and just also notice that this forum, TTT, is something that's been happening all along as these voices was developing. So 
Paul and Chris, it seems like you started this in an open way and doing that tinkering in an open way that was inviting other people in to tinker with you, um, which also feels like a really core idea of the work that you've developed over time and potentially a really core idea of how we continue to support each other in, in working this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, it's, I think this is related, but having done that video through uh, a hangout also um, with with the students, when, when Karen was able to, to come up to our school, they knew her already, which was really cool. They said, oh, you're that woman from the video. And so there was this, like, connection that was really cool um, and fast. So that, it was that really was cool awesome. for me, too. It was awesome. Yeah. Um, Bonita, do you – is it – Bonita, yeah. Do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? <laughs> oh, sure. I guess I probably missed a whole. <laughs> it's okay. I just want to get you. I'm going to be here. zipping out because I have a, a Halloween. Event so you will introduce on. yourself as you leave. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Uh, so I'm Bonita Diamichis. I'm a principal at a K through five, well, a pre pre K through five school in Los Angeles County. Hmm. I don't know how much people introduce themselves. I met Karen through uh, when I was a teacher. You know. Gosh, Karen, this probably goes back 10 years now. And I uh, worked with handhelds with the palm when Karen was doing the palm stuff. Um, so my students all did handhelds. It was a crazy world, and I loved it. Very messy, wonderful instruction. So how do you, how do you uh, keep a space for teachers who want to tinker? Boy, I'll tell you, in my district, I would say there is no space for tinkering, not for principals or teachers. Um, Reality. I know. That's the reality. That really? is the reality. There's such an alignment to the assessments and standards, and that is so um, ingrained that I'm not sure that there's room for, for anything more at this point. Uh, now, I have a very tight district that way, and I do have friends that are principals in districts that have a little bit more uh, freedom. Um, and I think if I were in one of those districts, I would probably do something like... Um, trying to think what the there was a book I was reading about creativity where it said you, you create a space so on Fridays is tinker day you know and so yeah Monday through Thursday you, we got to do this thing that we're doing but on Friday I want you to tinker and see what happens that's probably where I would go mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so now the way it happens in my school is if I have a teacher that goes that direction you know um, I'm excited for them, and we just try to find secret spots where they can do it. <laughs> so, Karen, I, I want to get to the last section here. This example highlights the final piece of the puzzle, teachers and learners being empowered to unleash innovation in their classroom. We know the power of personalization, self-directed learning, and other innovative practices. However, in too many places, teachers have been stripped of the ability to do what they know is best for learners. Now is the time to change that. I believe that if we seize the opportunity that Common Core presents by incorporating digital tools, openness, and student and teacher innovation, we can achieve some incredible things. The do-it-yourself or DIY movement has introduced many to a feeling of agency, has reinvigorated our senses of personal involvement, and has resulted in tremendous innovations. What if we embrace this as a learning culture and turn DIY into DIT, do it together? As a community, we have everything we need to create new curricula that accelerates deeper learning. Together, we could shift the billions spent on instructional materials toward internal investments in learning spaces and practices that prepare our students for the future. Teachers, learners, and the community at large could capitalize on the affordances of digital content and tools as well as openness to create a bright future for our schools and our world. This is a unique time to launch a new era for curriculum. Let's seize this opportunity and do something amazing with it. All right, so the one thing I want to say about the credits is I was really impressed with how many sources you used, i got to say. Make one for like three minutes. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs>
pretty pretty uh, detailed uh, work you did there. Thank you for that. Um, do you, what, what's been the reaction so far, and what do you want to say here toward the end? And then we'll just come around and get kind of final thoughts and uh, be done for tonight. But also, let's mention that uh, there will be ongoing conversation at p2pu.org. But Karen, you start with your final thoughts, and then we'll catch well, up with anybody else. Yeah. My, my, we're having a lot of interesting conversations in both chats, and I encourage everybody to jump in on that. But I guess my closing <laughs> thoughts are that this is that making this video and and getting everybody who brainstormed on it, which is everybody in this room and some other people, was just a phenomenal learning experience for me. And I really appreciate um, everybody participating in it, and I got a lot out of it. Um, and I just think that these are just hugely, hugely important issues. And I don't know, you know, where the chat is like, how do we get past this assessment thing and how do we get through all this? And I, I don't know the answers, but I think we need to keep having these discussions and really push on it because this is the where a lot of schools are right now, I think, is in a bad place. And it's not fair to our kids or our teachers or our society or anybody else. And we need to. We need to get to a better place. And Paul, I just loved being in your classroom, and I felt like it was a really great place. And thank you for thank letting you. me in there, and I enjoy the ongoing collaboration through um, Youth Voices. Cool. Um, and and you know what? What my thought at this point is to say that um, I don't want to go to any other workshops without student work there. You know, I don't want to just see the standards listed out to me. I want to say, show me the work. All right, show me show me what you want the kids to do. Um, so so for me, I think that may be one way to kind of approach this is is by uh, keeping student work at the center of all our conversations. But that's just one thought. Um, Sue, can we come back around to you and any thoughts? Give you last last thoughts here. Sure, um, there's so much. My my head is just spinning, and and unfortunately, I have to go to bed soon so I can get up early in the morning. But um, there's just there's so many pieces of this. I think um, you know when I look at the accessibility, I'm in a. I, I came from a district that had so so much in terms of resources. And um, now I'm in a district that has so, so little, and that makes a yeah, huge sweet. difference. But I think the other thing that I'm taking away is that um, little steps are okay or finding little pockets um, where some of this can happen um, is okay. And um, it doesn't have to be major overhauls in the whole system, that if I can find little little pockets in the district now. I had a fabulous conversation with um, some teachers yesterday who um, really kind of get it in a bigger sense and if I can start there with a couple then that will be good work. So, cool. Paul O, oh, thank you Sue. Hi, sorry about that. I was busy typing in the chat. I was reviewing all the great um, conversation that was happening. Which will be attached to this, and uh, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> and there'll be yeah. links to it. Go ahead. I'm, like, too old for all these chats, let me just say, um, <laughs> you know, in, in all these multiple spaces, uh, what's going on. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to add one last thing to this, um, you know, to, to my depiction of you as a tinkerer, um, Paul, because I think... Uh, the, the, the other piece to this, and I think Chris, Christina was beginning to allude to this, that I think is really um, powerful is this idea of, uh, you know, how do we as educators um, create um, a, a voice, you know, that can actualize change? Um, and how do we include uh, the educators whose voices are not generally heard? Um, and, uh, and I would just say that I think like you and, and Chris Sloan here in TTT, as Christina was saying, um, you know, you've created this, uh, what our colleague Lise Eidman-Dahl has described as a third space for teachers. And I think, you know, she was presaging um, personal and professional learning networks in that way. I think it's, you know, what the National Writing Project is, you know, is this, um, is this network of, of teacher collaboration um, and teacher agency. Uh, so that that I think leads to you know student agency and efficacy and youth you know agency. 
So uh, that's like sort of a rambling close, but I think that you know that, that is important too um, in in this conversation. You are a tinkerer, but I think you're a tinkerer also within the uh, many of uh, m many different sort of professional networks um, that supported you and that you supported in turn. Cool. Monica. Thanks. I always um, fall back on Erica McWilliams, um, her article about unlearning and the skill that we all need is to learn how to learn to be usefully ignorant and so that fits with what Paul's saying about Paul and um, the more that we can model our vulnerability in context of you know trying to figure out what to do when we don't know what to do I think is the best the best thing that we have and so that's way out there for some of the curriculums that people are in so a very simple way to to bring yourself towards that if, if that is the direction you want to go towards is just believing every day that it's legal to think for yourself because I think a lot of us some of Chad's comments allude this direction um, a lot of us think that we're not um, it's not that's not a thing that's legal for us to do and which seems ridiculous especially as as teachers but to deliberately teach less I think is, is key so mm. Christina, um, I just I, I I really appreciate being part of this conversation, and um, even this conversation as an experience is really interesting to think about and reflect on with the keynote and then the remixing of it. So, thank you. Um, after I looked at Karen's keynote, I sent her this link to um, a little video um, of Linda Christensen talking about. Um, why she wrote her book, Teaching for Joy and Justice. And she said that, or I, I'm probably mangle what she said, but part of it was just she feels it's so important to reinstill the joy of teaching as well as the joy of learning and bring them back together mm. um, in the context of social justice. And that feels like what um, everybody's sort of working on and exploring here. Um, and what I've seen um, is the joy, too, of you guys as educators working on this project. And what I saw in the video is the joy of the students working on their work and, you know, showing the grid they're working on and talking about their process. And um, so that's really exciting. And I think that the, um, keeping the student work at the center is a, is a really powerful idea, Paul. And even keeping their voices, like those interviews with them, is really powerful too. So, thank you. Thank you. Chris Sloan, you get last word tonight. Okay. Well, um, I too have made the pilgrimage to the school of Allison. Uh, a few years ago, I went and, and witnessed him uh, teaching in class. It's one of my pastimes, actually. I try to go to great teachers' classrooms. And, um, you know, what I noticed in Paul's and what I'm starting to see more and more is um, the public nature of learning. Um, and it's almost like I think of it uh, more and more like the metaphor of architectural school that, um, you know, like they're always learning in public, like their work is on display and it's critiqued by each other, but there's this, the idea of the master comes in and critiques work, um, and, and I think that's so valuable for students. So one of the things, you know, I've learned from Paul through the years is the, the power of public uh, in learning. You know, um, so that's something that I think if we talk about how can we do this better, like make student learning more visible, make student learning more um, public, like Paul does. That's cool. Well, thank you all for being public here tonight. I really appreciate it. And Karen, can you say again where um, where to go to continue this conversation? Just Absolutely. If you go to p2pu.org and just search for K-12 online and I'll put a link in the chat as well but all of the K-12 online videos will be posted there and anybody can participate in conversations around one or more or any of them and it's asynchronous whenever you have time and we have great conversations there and I really appreciate everybody being here and Paul you doing this every week because it's just I have gotten so much out of this Super. Great, and, and we do it every week um, through edtechtalk.com and uh, worldbridges.net, uh, Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo. 
And we will see you next week. Oh, by the way, Chad, who's been in the chat room, I think is coming on next week, if you can uh, manage it, with Minu, Minu Rami? Yes. Mm -hmm. To talk about um, Educon um, in, in Philadelphia. So um, come and talk about that next week, uh, next Wednesday. See you all. Good night. Thank Thanks. you. Good night. Good night, all. Good night, everyone.